Let me get the question from the chat. Okay, so we, the first question that we have is uh, a quote from Majjhima Nikaya 149. Uh, yes, it's from the Mahasala Yatani uh, Kasutta. And it says, monk, when one accurately knows and sees the mind, mental object, mind consciousness, mind contact, and whatever feeling arises from mind contact, whether pleasant, painful, or neutral. So the question is, when one is observing this phenomenon in deep meditation, one cognizes or perceives or becomes aware of the feeling that arises and decides it as pleasant, painful, or neutral. Uh, so is this the case that it's the mind that decides uh, the, the flavor of the feeling, if it's pleasant, painful, or neutral? And is it the perception that perceives the feeling and mind consciousness that cognizes the feeling that has arisen as pleasant, painful, or neutral? So what is it... Um, what is it that basically cognizes uh, the quality of the of the feeling as pleasant, painful, or neutral? Okay. Uh, one can uh, become aware of the whole series, uh, but end up in feeling because that is uh, most uh, dominant predominant. Uh, mental factor. In uh, another place, Buddha mentioned uh, Vedana Samosarana Sabbe Dhamma. All the, feel, all the mental phenomena converge in the feeling. Vedana Samosarana Sabbe Dhamma. All the mental phenomena converge, mix with feeling. From the feeling, one can, uh, when one, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, decompress the feeling, what opens there is uh, uh, consciousness, <coughs> perceptions, uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, contact. Uh, all these things will become will become clear. Uh, so uh, this happened when uh, you can see another discourse in Vajimanika uh, also, uh, Sutta number one one one, Anupada Sutta, where when the Sariputta saw all this. All of them, one by one, arising, remaining, and passing away in it in this order. So, an uh, ordinary person who is not as wise as Venerable Sariputta can start noticing the feeling as his uh, object of meditation. And then when the, the person uh, become aware of uh, feeling present, unpresent, or neutral, whichever or whichever of them is more prominent, one start with that, then the person sees the rest of the men mental phenomena occur occurring. So, you can your last part of your question is can feeling be taken as mind object yes you can take it that is why in uh, satipatthana sutta we have uh, mindfulness of body and mindfulness feel of feeling and mind of mindfulness of mind and mindfulness of mind object so feeling you can take as one both one quarter of four foundations of mindfulness. 
and therefore it is definitely uh, it can be taken it can definitely be taken as an object of meditation of, of mind object as a mind object yes <clears throat> yes any other question no uh, i don't see another one uh, at present in the chat so maybe we can go over what we discussed yesterday about hiri uh this sense of um the fear of wrongdoing and keeping more principles um a lot of times uh, there's a confusion between uh, this fear of wrongdoing and guilt uh, people feeling guilty if they've broken a precept or something can you um clarify the difference between the two and um how to overcome this sense of guilt when one knows uh, that one has done something wrong and that guilt can go into restlessness and worry into meditation yes uh, you know uh, the uh, once uh, uh, indebtedness is the is uh, lack of faith moral shame moral fear energy and mindfulness when one does not have them according to the buddha teaching he uses this as a, a simile of having uh, being indebted indebted debt to the people in order to overcome that we one must develop uh, the faith moral shame moral fear energy and wisdom one must develop these five qualities in order to pay the debt uh, without letting uh, interest accumulated and that is metaphorically uh, used by the buddha so in order to not to have remorse when one goes to a uh forest a solitary place cemetery and so forth uh, one would not feel guilty uh, and then one gain concentration very easily another example would the gave is in uh, madhyamini kaya bhaya bhairava sutta when uh, a, a, a brahmin called janu soni came to buddha and asked uh, when you uh, mount meditation in the forest the person will have fear and dread uh, buddha said yes if somebody goes there without uh, overcoming that person's uh, greed hatred sleepiness and drowsiness restlessness and worry and doubt certainly the person will have fear and buddha said as a bodhisattva when i go there into the forest i have overcome all of them and i am one of those who have who, who is free from uh, these things and therefore when i went there i was uh, able to concentrate without feeling any guilty without any having any fear so he had uh, uh, developed this energy his uh, what you call wisdom moral shame moral fear and uh, uh, faith all this he developed and therefore he did not have any fear in the uh, in practicing meditation in the forest he was free from indebtedness okay thank you bante uh, the next question is is it possible to overcome illness with your mind yes yeah, some illness as the caused by the uh, mind can be overcome by uh, uh, by uh, uh, through the practice of meditation and uh, some illness like uh, 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 caused by anger uh, sometimes when somebody is uh, getting angry very very often all the time 
that person will be really uh, sick. Sometimes it can irritate the mind, irritate the body, and that even can cause cancer. Uh, this has been uh, proven by the uh, re through the researchers, through the research, and therefore getting angry very often is harmful. So we practice meditation uh, to overcome that. We very diligently, very systematically for long period of time, you can reduce it. You know, I have heard some people who had some tumor and as they went on meditating, 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 they were able to reduce the tumor and eventually it uh, disappeared from their body. And that is possible. So that kind of illness, they can overcome. Yes. Thank you, Bante. The next question is, about 20 years ago, you came to Mexico and told us you just had been through a serious disease of which you had learned a lot. I didn't ask then, but I would like to know, what did you learn from being sick, from overcoming a serious disease? What did you learn? What did I learn? Uh, okay, you said 20 years ago, I, I went to Mexico, Australia, sure, and told us uh, you just had been through a, a serious, serious, disease. serious disease, yes, of which that was... Uh, uh, I had I lost my memory when I was twenty years ago, twenty years old. I mentioned this incident uh, to people uh, to encourage their uh, meditation practice. When I lost my memory, I lost it uh, because uh, I was doing some uh, chanting, uh, Buddhist chanting, for seven days day and night without sleep, without uh, eating. Uh, occasionally I had some drink and very little I ate and most of the time I was chanting with uh, another young monk of my age. Both of us were 20 years old and then uh, we kept on chanting, chanting for seven uh, days, whole week, day and night. At the end I lost my memory. That is a very, very serious thing. I don't know what happened to my brain. Uh, my nerves, nerves must have been totally paralyzed. Uh, so my uh, teachers, parents, all, they, all of them tried to uh, recover my memory and they, they did all that they knew all kind of medicine, nothing worked. Then I started practicing meditation, the four foundations of mindfulness meditation. This course I knew by heart when before I lost my memory. And I still, I still thought, even though I don't remember anything, I still thought if I meditate, my memory will return. Sure enough, I went on meditating for about uh, six, seven months. Then I began to uh, recognize alphabet, words, sentences, and so forth. And that's how I recover my memory slowly and slowly. But I never had my, pre my photographic memory that I had before I lost my memory. I never dis I never recovered that, but I was able to, you know, perform like an ordinary uh, person, uh, reading, writing, and so forth. All this came back to me through my meditation. In order to encourage people, uh, I mentioned this when I went to Mexico. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you please explain the term satara agati? Sakariti? 
Satara, Satara Agati. Uh, Satara Agati. S-A-T-A-R-A -A is the first word. Agati is the second one. A-G-A-T-I. Agati? Yeah, Satara Agati. Satara Agati Bante. Satara Agati, Satara Agati, yes, yes, yes. Chand Dosa Bhaya Moha. These are Satara Agati. Chand Dosa Bhaya Moha. Uh, Chand means will. Uh, you have uh, will, uh, biased will. Uh, you have biased towards something, uh, a person or opinion, uh, and so forth, you are biased with uh, will, chanda. And chanda has also a positive side. For instance, when we want to arouse our energy, we would to say chanda and janeti vayamiti viriyangarbhati chittam pagannati padati. That means unnerison, uh, unnerison, uh, unnerison, mental stage. We have to, uh, we have to make effort to prevent it from arising. There we need uh, chanda, in a, what you call wish, will. But as an agati, uh, as a bias, we use it in a negative way. Uh, that means you are bias towards some person, political parties, opinions, friends, and so forth, and for gaining some something material, you have a, you are biased. That is one agati, agati. Then those those is anger, resentment. You hate somebody, even the person does something very good. You don't approve it, and you see you find fault in that person because you are angry with that person. That is another another bias. And uh, the third is by out of fear. You 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 find that if you tell the truth, you will be punished. So out of fear you become biased. And then last is uh, delusion. Moha, moha. You are confused and therefore you cannot make right decision. So you are biased towards certain things, certain person, certain opinion, and you uh, support that person. That kind of uh, biases is called agati. Then there are four. Satara, satara means four. Okay. Next question. The next question is uh, again a, a quote from the Sutta. Whatever feeling, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all feelings are not mine. I am not them nor are they myself. Thus, it should be correctly seen with wisdom as it is. So the question is, Bhante, can you give some examples for us to understand better what internal feelings, external feelings, subtle feelings, and gross feelings are? Okay. Uh, this passage you feel, you find, especially in... Uh, uh, Anatta Lakkana Sutta. Mm -hmm. In Anatta Lakkana Sutta, it was just a tall uh, form, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness are without self. So, in order to uh, prove that, he used this uh, passage, uh, whatever feeling, whether the past, future, present, internal, external, gross, or subtle, low or high, far or near, all feelings are not me, mine, 
I'm not them, nor are they myself. Thus they should be seen as they are, as with wisdom, correctly with wisdom as they, it is. Now, uh, given some uh, example for us to understand better, uh, what internal feelings and external feelings, subtle feelings and gross feelings are? Well, internal feeling is your feeling. That you have feeling, at least your feeling, your internal feeling. And once you understand the internal feeling, your feeling does not, is impermanent, unsatisfactory, without self. And the feeling of others also, anybody's feeling, is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and selfless. So internal feeling means your feeling, external feeling is others' feeling. Subtle feeling is that you uh, you are very, uh, some feeling is very mild, uh, not very uh, clear, but you still have some feeling. That's called subtle feeling. Gross feeling is the feeling of aches, pains, uh, you know, uh, losing somebody you you love and uh, having to live with someone who don't you don't like, and this kind of uh, uh, feelings are gross feelings. The subtle feelings are very gentle uh, feelings, and that is how we have to understand these two types of feelings. Uh, this this uh, contrast, internal and external, uh, subtle and gross, and so forth, uh, far, far, far or near, uh, far, far or near, yes, uh, subtle, low or high. Uh, low feeling is uh, uh, you are not so excited. You just have gentle feeling. High feeling is you are excited. Uh, far feeling is uh, a feeling that you had uh, in certain place uh, far away from your own. And near is the feeling that you get through the environment right around you, uh, very close to your heart, very close to your body, very close you can perce perceive it easily. And so. This is how we have to make the distinction between these contrasts. Okay? <clears throat> Thank you, Bande. The next question is, if all five skandhas are not mine, uh, who and what strives to achieve Nibbana? So the, the five skandhas, if they are not mine, then who is it that strives to achieve Nibbana? And then if all people on the planet achieve Nibbana, would that be a good thing? Yes, when all the five, actually <laughs> the seeing, all of them are not mine. They are not I, they are not myself. Seeing itself is really seeing Experiencing uh, <coughs> itself is achieving Nibbana. But the problem is people try to uh, make these five aggregates and uh, uh, work hard to attain Nibbana. They try to separate it. <coughs> you cannot separate. Uh, you, you, for instance, when your feeling is uh, impermanent, unsatisfactory, and selfless, you don't find any other uh, form which has uh, permanent, uh, without pain, and with self. So you can, uh, don't try to make a sort of dichotomy. So when you realize that all the aggregates are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without self, that is that realization 
that realization. The understanding intellectually is one thing. Understa understanding uh, with your uh, studies and logics, philosophy and so forth is one thing. But the realizing is something different. So when we realize, you already realize at the same time Nibbana. So you don't say, don't try to separate it. If all people on the planet <laughs> attain uh, Nibbana. Yeah, would that be a good thing? Yeah, attain <laughs> Nibbana. Uh, will that be a good thing? Definitely, it is very, very good thing, excellent thing. Then you don't have to worry about anything, anybody, any philosophy, any talk, any politics, anything. <laughs> you don't have to worry. So I wish everybody attained uh, enlightenment. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. <laughs> While some people attain Nibbana, others remain in samsara. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, that is happening. So, uh, and if, if everybody attain Nibbana, that's very, very good. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, the next question is, does a person who has attained stream entry know about it? Does he know about the, his state? So, if a person and attains stream entry, would they know? Or oh, I'm a stream stream enterer now. Do they recognize this state, or would it be so natural they wouldn't even know? Surely, you know, when one, it doesn't happen like uh, having a dream or uh, something like that. You strive hard, you work hard, you practice, practice the noble eight four path again and again and again and again, then you attain stream entry. Uh, so you know it. You know your uh, notion of self is gone. Your doubt is gone. Uh, your belief in rites and ritual is gone. Uh, once they are gone from you, uh, disappeared, <coughs> Uh, you know for sure that uh, you attain stream entry. It is. It doesn't happen like a dream. Once you once you dream something, next morning you will try to recollect the dreams, but you cannot uh, find the reality of the contents of what you dream uh, in your dream. And so that's not like this. Okay, uh, next question. The next question, uh, it, it is said that our hands don't experience any more suffering, but do they have Dukkha Vedana? And that would be Dukkha. Can you please explain? Do our hands still have Dukkha Vedana? Uh, it is yes, that our hands uh, may have Vedana, feeling. But Vedana, definitely. But they don't suffer from the Vedana. They don't experience Dukkha from Vedana. Dukkha is uh, the ordinary people have Dukkha because they don't understand the cause of Dukkha and the end of Dukkha, path leading to the end of Dukkha. They don't understand. In short, Four Noble Truth. But the Arahant has understood all the Four Noble Truth. And therefore, even though he has aches and pains, he doesn't suffer. You see, suffering is one thing, and uh, experiencing pain and aches and pain is uh, another. No, you see, the uh, Pain, one can have, even the Buddha had pain when they were at the, uh, hurled a uh, rock on him. It hit another rock and broke a little splinter, hit his foot. That time he had a terrible pain. But he did not suffer from that. 
uh, even whenever Mughalana was beaten to death, uh, thieves came and broke all, all his bones by beating. He, he had the pain, but he did not suffer. So this is very subtle distinction, actually very deep distinction between pain and suffering. So they do not have dukkha, dukkha vedana, but they have painful feeling. Thank you, Vante. Okay. Next question is, some people claim to be able to separate nama from rupa. Are you confirming that this is not possible, but rather that simply realizing not self in any one of them, in any one of the nama rupa uh, components is enough to realize nibbana? Okay. Now, in meditation, there is a moment called nama rupa paricheda. Nama rupa paricheda. That means separation of name and form, mentality and materiality. Mentality, as we all know, uh, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness, and attention. These five together is called Nama. And uh, 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 element made up, the entity made up of element, earth, water, air, fire. These are the elements. And one can uh, see the distinction between these two. Although this is extremely difficult because uh, uh, materiality eventually uh, can be broken down to very, very, very minute subatomic level, uh, like to, as, as like a molecule. And yet, yet it is material. Uh, mentality is not anything material in it. That is uh, different. But these two are very close to each other in, uh, in uh, when we analyze. But one who meditates, one can see the distinction between these two, mentality and materiality. That is why. In meditation, this particular term is used, nama rupa paricheda, uh, distinction between name, mentality, and materiality. That happens in a very deep uh, mindfulness uh, meditation. Okay, it is possible. Okay, I think we can have one more short question. Okay, the, and then the last question is, uh, what can you recommend to prevent or decrease the hindrance of sloth and torpor in one's practice? Okay, I I think we mentioned it several times. Uh, Aloka Sanya, Buddha mentioned Aloka Sanya, perception of bright light. That means one can uh, visualize very, very, very bright light. And I also recommend that if uh, uh, Sloth and Topa repeat, uh, first try to uh, open your eyes and roll your eyeballs and uh, close and start meditating. If that doesn't work, you get up and walk and do walking meditation. If, doesn't, if that doesn't work, you may wash your face with cold water. The first thing Buddha recommended is visualizing very bright light, aloka sanya. And these are the methods one has to apply to overcome uh, sloth and topa. Actually, it happens to any meditator, and therefore open your eyes. Anytime you feel sleepy, open your eyes and stay eyes open. And your eyelids become very, very heavy and you are going to fall asleep. Again, determined to take a deep breath and hold it as long as you can. 
and then breathe out very slowly. Again, take a deep breath and breathe out very, uh, hold it, first hold it, and then breathe out slowly. If you do it several times, your body really warms up and you even perspire, your sleepiness will disappear. I think this much is enough for today's uh, uh, answer. Thank you. Bhante. And if you have more questions, please write them for the next time. Now let us uh, meditate because we have only about 25 minutes. We need some time for meditation as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother who risks her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment. Whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision. Removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. So let us meditate now.
By means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the foolish, may I join always with the wise, until the time I attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings be. From the highest realm of righteousness to the lowest, May all beings arisen in these realms, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So with this we end our today's session. And let me make my regular Metta wish, may all those who are in hospitals suffering from various diseases taken care of by various doctors, nurses, hospital staff, may they recover very quickly and return to normal life, continue their practice of meditation. Even while they are in the hospital, they can meditate uh, and uh, gain some insight, wisdom, mindfulness, and try to liberate themselves from suffering. But the doctors, uh, nurses, and hospital staff who are taking care of these people with, with uh, compassion, out of compassion, and risking their life, but sometimes uh, sacrificing their comfort. May they also find time to practice meditation. I think if they do that, they can do their service even better. And they gain insight into the reality and attain liberation from sansaric suffering. May all those who have lost their loved ones in various places in the world, may they all be free from their uh, suffering. May they find some time to, to understand the Dhamma, practice meditation, liberate themselves from samsari suffering. And finally, may all those who are in northern direction, northeastern direction, eastern direction, southern direction, eastern direction, southeastern direction, southern direction, southwestern direction, western direction, northwestern direction, up and below. May they all find time to practice meditation. May they all be well, happy, and peaceful. And may they all find time to understand Dhamma and liberate from samsaric suffering. With this, friends, Sad. I like to end this session. And I hope to see you next Sunday. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you very much, Bhante. Thank you, 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 Bhante.